All right, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, and please look at verse number, I'm just turning my notes, verse number 7. It says, So that contrarywise, ye ought rather to forgive him. The title of the sermon this tonight is Forgive Him. Forgive Him. This whole chapter, if you've not realized, well, not the whole chapter, most of this chapter, the theme of it is forgiving one another, especially forgiving one that has done wrong to this Corinthian church. Okay, now let's pick it up from verse number 1, verse number 1, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1. Paul writing to this church, But I determined this with myself, that I would not come again to you in heaviness. Now, I know it's been a little while since we did chapter 1, but why would it be coming in heaviness? If you can just look at the previous chapter, verse number 23, remember that Paul had not yet come to visit this church, though he had planned to do that. And then in chapter 1, verse 23, Paul says, Moreover, I call God up for a record upon my soul, that to spare you I came not as yet unto Corinth. So you remember that Paul had spared the church from his rebuke, from his wrath, from his, from his presence, and rebuking this church sharply for the many faults that they had, the many sins that they, ha- they had. And that was the reason why he had not yet travelled into this church. So then when we get to chapter 2 and look at verse number 1 again, just to, just to continue that thought, but I determined this within myself, that I would not come again to you in heaviness, or being burdened, being grieved. Okay? He doesn't want to go to this church in sorrow, in heaviness of heart. Okay? Because, because of that purpose, if he comes with that heaviness of heart and he sees the continual sin that the, the church had, he would have let it rip and he would have you know, really uh, hurt this church. Okay? But for what reason, we look at verse number 2, for what reason would he come in heaviness of heart? He says, for if I make you sorry, who is he then that maketh me glad? Sounds a little selfish there, Paul. Like, if I come and I make the whole church sorry, if I, if I come and bring great sorrow to this church, and you guys are all depressed and all upset and grieved to the heart, which of you are going to make me glad? Right? He's saying, who's going give me, to give me the opportunity to rejoice? But the same which is made sorry by me. So we see that Paul is, you know, is mindful that if I go into this church and I cause more sorrow than they've already uh, received by my first letter, then when I come, I'm going to be sorrowful. And we're just going to be a very sorry church. Everyone's going to be down and depressed. You know, there's not going to be any life in that church. There's not going to be any encouragement. There's not going to be any edification. It's just going to be a sorry church and a sorry apostle. So what we see Paul, what he wants is to find joy in this church. He wants them to find joy in him, and he wants to find joy in that church, which is why he's given this church extra time to get right with the Lord. He gives them extra time to correct the sins that they have in their church, so that way he doesn't have to come in this sorrow, he doesn't have to come and rebuke them, even more so for, for, the, for the mistakes that they've made in their church. And uh, so Paul's ultimate desire is to be glad. He wants to come into this church and rejoice, right? He wants to be happy. He wants to encourage this church, right? We see that's the ultimate goal. The reason why he wanted to cause this church to grieve and be sorry is so they would fix the problems in the church, you know? But I think we can take a principle and apply this to our own life. You know, what are you like in your, as an individual, are you someone that's always sorry? Are you always someone that's full of sorrow, always depressed, always cast down, always angry at the world? Because what we learn out of this, if that's who you are, if that's your natural disposition, then you're going to cause people around you to be sorrow- sorrowful. You're going to cause people around you to be depressed. Okay? You have an influence in the people you interact with, in your church, your family, your work colleagues, whoever it is that you interact with, your demeanor will have an impact on other people. You know, if you're someone that's always upset, always have a negative outlook on life, you're going to be a very depressing person to be around. People won't want to be around you. People won't want to be your friend if you're that way. But if you're someone that's rejoicing, if you're trying to find, you know, that, that silver lining, you know, um, if you're always someone that's trying to f- find that positive um, w- uh, aspect, always trying to say, hey, how, yes, this is a bad state, but how can we improve things? Then people will want to be your friends because they see you and as, as an encouragement. Okay? So just t- think about this. I know this is the context of a church, but think about your own personal life. How can you apply what we see here? Obviously, a sad church is going to make Paul sad, and he's an apostle, right? 
And so he wants to be glad. He wants to make sure that we as a church are rejoicing in one another. You know, and if you have friends that are in a constant state of sorrow, constantly depressed, constantly cast down, you know, and I think we've all had friends like this, or at least one, we've experienced this. We know that just being around them is depressing. We don't really even want to be there. We don't even want to be like, you know, I mean, first of all, you want to encourage them. First of all, you want to get them, you know, get them out of that depression and get them, you know, excited and happy again. But when you're there week after week after week and constantly sorrow, constantly that negative outlook on life, you know that has an impact on you and you just don't want to be there anymore. Don't, don't be the reverse. Don't be the one that's always sorrowful. You know, try to, you know, it's not that sorrow is bad. Sorrow has a purpose. Right? And the purpose was, so this church would go, man, we're in a bad state. Let's do something to fix this. Let's, let's make sure we fix this. At least when Paul the Apostle comes, you know, we're on the road of, of, of improvement. Like He can see that we've changed as a church. Yeah, we might not be perfect. Yeah, we might still be struggling in some of these areas, but we're trying our best to put into practice the things that we received in his first epistle. Verse number three. And I wrote this same unto you, lest when I came... I, sh- I should have sorrow from them of whom I ought to rejoice, having confidence in you all that my joy is the joy of you all. So I think what we see with, with this, this second letter is that Paul is setting the tone for his visit to this church. He doesn't want to come, like I said, to a church that's sorrowful. He wants to come to a church that's rejoicing. Okay? So he's setting the tone, look, I want to be there and I want to, be, uh, I want to rejoice in you. I want, I want you to find joy in me and for me to find joy in you. He doesn't, want to, he doesn't want them sorrowing at his arrival, but that Paul would find joy in them. Joy, joy in them. And, uh, and in return, they would find joy in him. Look at verse number four. For out of much affliction. Now pay attention to this. Now, as we read through 1 Corinthians, Paul let it rip. Right? He really took down this church. I mean, he was using sarcasm. He was using every, everything that he had to just tear down the pride of this church. Right? To make them realize just how foolish they were, how, how carnal they were, how, much, how many problems they had. And they were reject, you know, that some of them were not believing in the resurrection of the body. You know, they had divisions, they had their favorite preachers, and, and they had all, the, all these problems. They were allowing major sins into the church. And, you know, on the sidelines, we might look at a letter like that and go, yeah, let it rip, Paul. You know, tear them apart. They deserve to be taken down, right? You might be rejoicing going, yeah, this church deserves it. But then look at verse 4. In, in what way was he rebuking this church? Verse 4. For out of much affliction and anguish of heart, I wrote unto you with many tears. Is that the impression you got reading 1 Corinthians? That he's writing this with many tears? That's what he's saying. He was weeping over this church. Yes, he was letting it rip. Yes, he was rebuking them. Yes, he was telling him, them some hard truths. But then he was weeping about it. He, he had anguish in his heart that he didn't even have to write these things. That he didn't even have to address the problems th- that he had to with this church. And, you know, that would make you, you know, if, if you ever think about being a preacher or a pastor or anything like this, there are times you have to let it rip. Okay, to your own church. There are times you have to call out those sins. There are times you have to make those hard decisions, kick people out of the church like we saw the Corinthians had to do, right? But at the same time, you ought to be someone that when you're at home, you're weeping about the fact that you have to do that because it shows the sincerity that you have in your heart. It shows that it's not just in the flesh that you're doing these things, right? And, and people in the church may not even see that, but the Lord sees the weeping. And if you remember uh, when we went through Psalm chapter 6, and we saw how King David was weeping because the chastisement of the Lord was upon him. That's one reason to weep, right? That's one reason to, to seek God's uh, mercy and forgiveness. But in this case, if you want to be a preacher that loves your people, yeah, sometimes you've got to give them those hard truths. But hey, they ought to see that you're a sincere person. You're doing it because you love them, right? Look, I wrote unto you with many tears, verse number four. Not that ye should be grieved, but that ye might know the love that I, uh, which I have more abundantly unto you. Right? It's out of love. Okay? It's not out of this desire to be, you know, seen as this, I don't, I don't know, you know, some hotshot preacher, uh, you know, full of pride and full of zeal. No, you know, when we preach, people ought to see that it's out of love, it's out of sincerity. And you probably know of preachers that when you hear them preach, you don't, just, you don't see the sincerity in them. 
You don't know. I mean, what is this? Is this, are you just, you know, uh, make it, trying to make a name for yourself or do you truly have a love for God's people? Okay, so um, I just want to quickly, we don't need to turn there. I'll just read to you quickly Proverbs chapter 27, verse 5. Proverbs 27, verse 5, it says, uh, <laughs> I like reading it, but I don't like applying it to myself. Okay, Proverbs 27, verse 5, it says, Open rebuke is better than secret love. Being rebuked is better than, than secret love. And then verse 6, Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. So if I ever preach from the Word of God and it wounds you, and maybe intentionally or unintentionally, it doesn't really matter, right? as long as it's coming from the Word of God, if I wound you with my words, I want you to know that those words are from a friend, that they're faithful wounds that I, I, I want us as a church to fix. And if you come and you rebuke me in love, right? The Bible says how we ought to address, and one day I'll probably have to cover that, how we need to address an elder. Uh, but still, if, if I hear rebuke from you, then I'm going to receive that in love. And that's hard. It, it's hard because the flesh is there. You get offended. You think, well, who are you to tell me, you know, that I need to fix this? Or who are you to tell me? And look, even if your advice is wrong, even if the rebuke is wrong, if I know you're someone that loves me, if I know you're my brother in Christ, and we've been, we've been in this church together for a number, of, time, you know, a number of, of years. We've been preaching the gospel together. I know you're a genuine believer. I know you genuinely love me. And when you come to rebuke me in love, you know, as an elder, then I, I will take that seriously. Even if I think you're wrong, I will still pause and think about it. Are these faithful wounds of a friend? I'd rather receive that. And I hope you would rather receive that than the kisses of an enemy. But in the flesh, I want the kisses of the enemy. I'd rather have the enemy just, you know, kiss and uh, speak well of me. But really, the reason they do that is because they want to they wanna come in and cause you harm and damage you and hurt you. Hurt you or hurt the church, hurt your family, hurt believers, right? I mean, at first, those kisses seem nice, but they're there for an ulterior motive. Remember when Judas came to kiss Christ? He had an ulterior, ulterior motive, right? He was picking him out as the one that needed to be killed and crucified. Um, so let's look at verse number 5. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 5. Uh, but if any... Now, read, let's read this slowly. But if any have caused grief... Now, I want you to think of this any as the man that was kicked out of the church. Well, the man that in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, the man that had that, that inappropriate physical relationship with his stepmother, that Paul said, you've got to kick me out of the church... That's what I believe the any is being referred to here, okay? So just keep that in mind as we read it. But if any have caused grief, so this is someone in the church that has caused grief in the church. He hath not grieved me, but in part, so actually he has grieved me, but it's more about grieving the church, that I may not overcharge you all. Now, I don't know if, you've, if reading that makes any sense. You've kind of had to think about it for a while. But I truly do believe that this any person, this person is that man that was caught in that serious sin with his stepmother. And then he's saying, it has not grieved me, but in part. So it's nothing personal toward Paul, but it still grieved him that this person had this sin in the church. Now, he says that I may not overcharge you all. Think about what that... So if you've been overcharged, you know, you've gone to a shop and you've bought, let's say this... How much was this water, brother? Two dollars. Did I just remove your blessing there? Yes. By making, yeah. Sorry, man. <laughs> yeah, right. Two dollars. All right. Let's say you, you went to the shop and you paid three. You, you gave a five dollar note and they didn't give you change, and you, you, you and then you realize later you, you would say, well, I was overcharged. That wasn't fair. That wasn't right. Okay. But think about what's happening here in this passage is that Paul is rebuking, has rebuked his church, has said, hey, you've got to kick this individual out of the church. So in what way is he being careful not to overcharge them? Is that he's not blaming the whole church for the sin. He's saying, look, that individual is to blame. That, that guilty party is to be blamed for the sin of the church. And yes, the rest of the, sin, the, sorry, the, rest of the church was to blame as well because they allowed it to continue. 
But Paul is being very careful that when we're trying to point out sin, that we make sure that the guilty party knows they're the one that's being talked about. They're the one that's going to be kicked out of the church and not to criticize the whole church because of one person. Otherwise, you're kind of overcharging everybody else. And you're like, well, hold on, Paul, that wasn't me. That was this person over there. Okay, this is important. And if I ever have to pull you aside and have some stern words with you, first of all, it's because I love you, but it's also because I don't want to hurt all the church. Okay, it's something that I may need to deal with you directly, and I will do that if the need comes. Okay, so I hope that kind of makes sense of what that verse is about. Uh, but I'll, I'll, let me give you a bad example of how we can overcharge. Let me give you a business example, okay? Because I, I told you guys that I had a lot of employees under me at one stage in my life. And one thing that I found, uh, of like one, one bad business practice that I found, was let's say you, you had a group of 50 employees, but there's only like two or three that are causing some problems. They're having a fight or, or they're, they're not doing the work prob, uh, properly. Uh, you know, what I believe should be done and what we see here is that those two or three individuals should be taken aside and dealt with. But bad business, business practice was to get everybody out for a team meeting and then rebuke the whole group you know, and, and you, what you, you know, and the intention is right. You want to make sure these two or three individuals are the ones that get the message, but they're not the ones that get the message. And it's everyone else that goes, well, why are we being rebuked? Why are you having a go at us when it's these people over there? Why aren't you telling them? And that caused bad morale, okay? Because they're like, well, what, why? Why am I in this meeting? Why are we copying this flag? It's not even me. It's got nothing to do with me. And that was, I saw that as bad business practice. And so whenever there were people that I need, needed to pull up, I would pull them up and not embarrass them in front of everybody, just pull them up privately and, and deal with it. And usually, more often than not, you could get things fixed. That's the same approach that Paul has ha is having here, right? He's saying, hey, that, that individual, that's the person that needs to be dealt with. So, you know, I don't want to overcharge you all. I don't want to make you all feel, uh, destroy the church with bad morale. Let's look at verse number six. Verse number six. Sufficient to such a man is this punishment, which was inflicted of many. So this man who was kicked out of the church, they did the right thing. Thank God that they listened to Paul in the first letter and they didn't think of themselves so prideful that they'd made the decision, hey, this person, yeah, all right, let's, let's take that on board. We need to kick him out of the church because this is a major sin. We need to make sure this leaven is out of the church. Otherwise, it's going to leaven the whole lump. This man was kicked out of the church. He served out his punishment. Paul is saying sufficient to such a man is this punishment. He had served out his punishment, which means to me that this man had repented of what he had done. He had realized, yes, I'm in the wrong. Yes, I need to stop having this, uh, this relationship with my stepmother, and I need to go and, and ask for forgiveness from my church. That's the point of kicking someone out. It's not because you hate them and you just want them destroyed in their life, but that they would get right, that they would repent and come back and apologize for what they've done. Okay, this is why the theme of this chapter is forgiveness. Forgiveness is hard as well, though. I don't know about you. I find, I find forgiving people sometimes, if they've wronged me personally, very hard. Even if they say sorry, I still, I still want, I want more. No, look, sufficient to such a man is this punishment. Okay? Now, uh, let me just quickly, what do you mean, like, uh, sorry, the last bit there, which was inflicted of many. So, of many means it wasn't just the church, uh, sorry, it wasn't just the pastor that kicked this man out of the church. If we ever have to make a decision to kick someone out of the church, it's a church decision. It's a decision of many, meaning you need to back your pastor if such an action needs to take place. Okay, it's a, it's, it's a decision of many. And I'll just quickly, actually you can turn there because you're, you're in, you're in uh, uh, 2 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. which is the chapter about church discipline. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11. Verse 11. It says, But now I have written unto you... You guys probably know this off by heart now. <laughs> After we've, we keep reading this every time we have that series of being, you know, um, sins that will get you kicked out of church. But now I have written unto you not to keep company if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner. With such and one know not to eat. So this is the, inflict, the, 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 uh, the punishment. This is part of the punishment. Not that they're just kicked out of the church and they're not allowed to come back in. 
but that nobody in the church would fellowship with that person. You wouldn't be, feel, oh man, I feel really sorry for that person. I'm going to take him out for a coffee and, and, and cheer him up. No. Otherwise, you're not allowing the punishment to serve its purpose. It is harsh on purpose. Okay? It is harsh on purpose. So they could, you know, realize, I've just lost all my, the fellowship that I have in my church. I've just lost all my friends that I have in my church. And realize, man, I, I need that fellowship back. Right? We want them to repent and come back and seek forgiveness. But if you're, listen, if I kick someone out of, the, let's say Cameron, because let's say I kick Cameron out of the church, right? And all of you, you feel really sorry and you, and, you, and you fellowship with Cameron, you invite him over, you take him out, you go to Aussie World and, and, and you know, go on the rides. He's going to be like, woo, this is awesome. This is better than church. <laughs> it was a good thing that I was kicked out of the church. But, it, but if everyone shuns him, I don't like that word, but you know, that's kind of the idea. If everyone, he's going to realize, man, I'm, I'm alone. I'm alone. You know? and he, he, then he will get a hold of God and go, God, please, what do I need to do to restore this, this fellowship with my Christian brethren? We want them back. We want these people back that get kicked out of the church. Even in such a terrible sin like this individual man did. Okay? And I don't, I don't know if I will ever see a sin like that in this church. Um, but anyway, I mean, even a sin like that, they're allowed back and we ought to forgive them. Uh, look at verse number 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 7. So that contrary-wise, ye ought rather to forgive him. So we've inflicted him, now it's time to forgive him. And comfort him. Whoa! <laughs> like forgiving someone is, is, is one thing, right? But then to comfort him as well, lest perhaps such a one should be not swallowed up with over, over much sorrow. So if, someone, if someone's kicked out of this church, they, they, they repent, they ask for forgiveness. Yes, we forgive them, but we don't just, oh, okay, you're back in the church, we let you back in. No, you comfort. You comfort that person. You go and encourage that person. Well done. Good work that you've turned from that. Brother, it's such a blessing to have you back in the church. We want to see you back in there, winning souls, knocking doors. Let's get back out there. You know, uh, you know this has been dealt with. Let's, we don't need to address this anymore. Thank God that you've come back and be an encouragement to this person. But I've seen people leave church, come back to church, and no one comforts them. No one comforts them. And then it's like, it's, it's like, they were, it's, it's like they're still kicked out because no one's talking to them. You know, no, you forgive them and then you comfort them as well. And look, this is the same thing with child discipline. When my child does something wrong and they get that rod of correction, they cry, then the expectation is that they would would say sorry, that they would ask for forgiveness, and I forgive them. But then we comfort them and say, well, it's all over now. You know, it's been dealt with. You know, let's, all right, let's move on. Let's go back and continue. Otherwise, what's the problem? If we don't comfort them, it says, lest perhaps such an one should be swallowed up with over much sorrow. Otherwise, if we don't comfort them, they're just going to be full of depression, full of sorrow, and they'll probably leave the church anyway because no one's there loving them, no one's showing them that comfort that, he, that you know, he deserves. I mean, someone that's come in and asked for forgiveness, you know that it takes them, it, it, that their ego has been taken down, you know, you know they've come in humility. It's not an easy thing to ask for forgiveness, right? And if someone's done that, you know, all right, come on, you know, let's, let's be fair. All right, let's stop, you know, criticizing this person. This person's, you know, doing what's right. Let's forgive them and comfort them and get them back into the church. Verse number eight. Verse number eight. Wherefore I beseech you. What does it mean to beseech? To implore. It's urgent. It's important. Wherefore I beseech you that ye would confirm your love toward him. That's part of the comfort. Part of the comfort. He's saying, look, you need to confirm your love. You need to tell him that you love him. That you, that, you, you know, you, that you miss him, that he wasn't there for church during that period of time. Comfort that, that person. And look, let me encourage us, like we are a, a small church and we all know one another and we all converse you know, with one another, but should this church ever grow and get larger, there's going to be, there's going to come times where individuals feel a bit left out. Okay, there might not be people that are kicked out of the church or anything, just, they just feel left out, you know, it might take them a while to adjust. Look, we need to confirm our love toward our brethren. We need to comfort them, make sure they feel that they're important to that church, because they are important. If they're important to the Lord, if they're our brothers in Christ, they're important to the Lord, they have to be important to us. Uh, verse number nine. Uh, for, and by the way, let me just say, let me say one more thing with the love, confirm your love toward him. I was just talking about child discipline there. 
I always tell my kids after I discipline them that I love them. You know, I don't want them to think that when we discipline them and cause them pain, oh, mom and dad hate us. No, I always tell them I love them. And I always tell them, why do we discipline you? You know, it's because we hate you? No, you love us. Yeah, that's right. You know, we do it out of love, even though we don't really want to do it because we know that it hurts our kids to discipline them, but it's out of love. And this is the same idea. You know, Paul has to do it. He, it grieved him in the heart, but he does it. His, this is his expression of love toward the church so they would improve. Verse number nine. For to this end I also did write that I might know the proof of you, whether ye be obedient in all things. So, you know, he recognizes that they've been obedient to kick this guy out of the church, but now he's trying to prove their obedience. Are you going to forgive him? Are you going to bring him back? Are you going to comfort and love him? You know, verse number 10. To whom ye forgive anything, I forgive also. And if I forgave anything, to whom I forgave it, for your sakes forgave I, forgave I it in the person of Christ. So what I get out, get out of this verse is that Paul obviously has the authority of the, an, an, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Okay, and he's, he's speaking as he is moved by the Holy Ghost as he writes th these scriptures. Okay, and what I think Paul is trying to reinforce in this church is yes, this man deserves forgiveness, but it's not just you that's forgiven him, but Jesus Christ has forgiven him as well through me. Because I've forgiven the man, and he says there uh, uh, at the end of it, for your sakes forgave I it in the person of Christ. Okay, so why is it important to forgive someone that's been kicked out of the church, bring them back in, love them, comfort them? Is because Christ has forgiven them also. And if Christ has forgiven them, then who are we to not forgive them? Okay, but you know, you know, ha so how do we apply this principle? Because we don't have apostles today. Just the fact that if a repentant sinner comes back to the church seeking forgive forgive forgiveness, that the church ought to forgive him because Christ has forgiven him. Okay, that's the that's the practical application that we can take out of this verse. We don't have apostles to tell us that Christ has forgiven us, but as a church, if we forgive someone, yes, it's because Christ has forgiven them. Uh, verse number 11, verse number 11. Lest, so if we don't do this, lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. This is amazing. So you, we might be like, oh, I, don't, I don't know, I mean, that guy made some serious sin there, Kevin. I mean, yeah, I mean, how can we be confident that this person's really sorry? You know, should we really forgive them? All right, let's allow them into the church, but let's not encourage them. Let's not do any of this. Look, that's pride within ourselves if we do that. If we don't forgive him, if we don't comfort him, if we don't love him, it says that Satan, this is an area in a church that Satan can get advantage of. Satan can use the lack of forgiveness in a church to destroy us. Paul says, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Satan will use whatever weakness he can see in a church to come and hurt the church. Okay, so, you know, it's one thing to allow this man in the church in his sin, because that'll hurt the church. But once he's kicked out and he wants to come back, we forgive, you know, repenting, uh, we forg you know, asking for forgiveness. If we don't forgive him, then Satan can use that uh, to his advantage as well. Okay, Satan can use that to his advantage as well and just hurt us. So it's not just for the benefit of the guy that gets kicked out of the church, but it's the benefit for the church that we forgive him. Otherwise, Satan will come and use that to his advantage. Now, in verse number 12, Paul gives further reason as to why he had not yet visited the Corinthian church. Let's look at verse number 12. So we're moving on from this topic of forgiveness now. Um, but Paul explains here that, furthermore, when I came to Troas, now I've not looked at where Troas is, I'm not sure, but he says, when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel, and a door was opened unto me of the Lord, I had no rest in my spirit because I found not Titus my brother. So he goes to Troas to preach the gospel, but then it troubles his spirit. He has no rest in his spirit because he doesn't find Titus there. You know, Titus is meant to be there, and he doesn't find him anywhere. This bothers his spirit. And then it says here, but taking my leave of them, so he leaves the people in Troas, I went from thence into Macedonia. Because if you remember in 1 Corinthians, in the first epistle, he said, I'm going I'm to make journey to come and see you. Well, as he's planning his trip, he gets to Troas, so he's supposed to meet Titus, but Titus is not there. 
And he worries, where's my brother in the Lord? So he goes looking for him. He goes into Macedonia. And so his plans to go to the Corinthian church are foiled, okay? Because he's worried about where Titus is. And so that's why he doesn't end up going to see them. Um, now, let me just say this, that, you know, God had arranged, and, 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 you know, he sees this in hindsight, but God had arranged a distraction for Paul in his attempt to visit the Corinthians, okay? So let me encourage you with this one. This happened to Paul. Your best laid out plans, the goals you have for your life, even if it's the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, even if it's serving him and doing the work of the Lord, sometimes those plans will be foiled. So sometimes those plans will be undone. And you might say, well, it's Satan. Satan's coming in and hurting my plans. But no, it was God. <laughs> sometimes it's God's plans to distract us. Okay? So God had put this, I don't know why, I don't know where God sent Titus, but it caused Paul to, be, um, to, to not follow the plan that he had laid out to go see the Corinthian church. And Paul probably at the time didn't even know why, why that's the case. But he recognizes in the letter, it's because if I came, I would come in great sorrow and you would be in sorrow and I'd probably even hurt you even the more. God knew that if I had come in the state that I was, it was going to hurt the church even more. And so he had to be delayed so this church could get these things right, that they'd have a greater time to improve so that way when Paul would come and see them, he would be filled with joy and that he would bring joy to this church. So don't get discouraged if your plans don't work out. It might be the Lord. You might not even know it at the time. But then you can look back and go, yeah, if I turned up early, it could have been bad. <laughs> it could have been bad. And we see this here in verse 14, following that. He says, Now thanks be unto God, which always causes... So even if our plans are foiled, which always causes us to triumph in Christ and maketh manifest the savour of his knowledge by us in every place. So it doesn't matter if our plans go according, if, go according to plan or not. We still try, if we're in Christ, we triumph in Christ. As long as we're trying to serve the Lord with our lives, it doesn't matter if things don't work out the way you planned, you have victory in Christ. One statement that I've always liked said, and I don't know which pastor came up with this, but this statement was, we're not fighting for victory, we are fighting from victory. We already ha we're already victorious in our life. We're already saved. We're already going on, on our way to heaven. We're already forgiven. The battles that we fight is not for victory. Christ has already triumphed. And if we're in Christ, we've triumphed with him. And we know how it all ends up. Yes, we see the wickedness of this world. Yes, we know there's going to be a rise of the Antichrist. Yes, we're going to see a persecution of believers to come. But we know how the end of the book, like how it ends. We know that Christ comes back. We know we rule and reign with him for a thousand years. And then we know that we, we, well, before that, we're given these resurrected bodies and then we're going to be in the eternal state with God, the new heavens and the new earth. We know we've already won if we're in Christ. So even if things don't work out in, the, in this world, you've already won spiritually with Christ. Okay? Now, he spoke about being a saver. Now, saver means like a smell. Like something that smells nice. You know, I don't know if you've... Do you guys like barbecues? I, I don't like it when it's like lunchtime or dinner time and some neighbor somewhere is doing a barbecue. Because I can smell it. I'm like, oh, I really want that. It's so, it smells so good. Now, you might, you might, there might be other savers that you like, but barbecue really does it for me. Uh, or if I, if, I, if, I, if I smell Christina um, cooking spaghetti for dinner. Oh, I'm really, I'm like, oh, yes. You know, <laughs> I'm going to have a big plate tonight. You know, that's... And that's what I'm thinking. So um, look at verse 15. For we, if you're in Christ, for we are unto God a sweet savour of Christ. So as pleasant as Christ is, because we're in Christ, we to God are a sweet savour. Okay? We smell good to God. Right? He, he likes us. Right? He loves us. Okay? But how? In them that are saved... And in them that perish. Well, what's this about? In them that are saved and in them that perish. So to God, we are a, a pleasant odor. Okay? And this is about soul winning. This is about knocking doors. This is about preaching the gospel. There are some that we see saved. And unfortunately, there are others, and that's the majority, that are going to perish. 
And you know, some days you might be out there and everyone rejects the gospel. Maybe everyone you even speak to will ultimately die and perish and go to hell. And you might be discouraged by that. You might think, my work, that was worthless. Why did I spend my day doing that? Why did I spend an hour, two hours serving the Lord? There's no success here. They've all rejected the gospel. They might all go to hell. But God says you're a sweet saver, even to them that perish, if you're working for the Lord. Look at verse 16. It adds a little bit more uh, to this. To the one we are the saver of death. So we're not just a saver to God, but we're also a saver to the people we preach to. To the one we are the saver of death unto death, and to other the saver of life unto life. And who is sufficient for these things? So let me start with the life unto life. So obviously we come with the words of eternal life. Obviously we come with the everlasting gospel that will give them everlasting life. And if they should receive the gospel, believe on the Lord, call upon the name of the Lord, they will be saved, praise God. They are saved. We have seen a number of people saved since the start of this church, praise God. Okay, And we are to them a sweet saver because we brought that life to them. It smells good, all right? But even a savor of death unto death. Now, because, see, even people that come and reject the gospel, when we talk to them, we say we're from, you know, the local Baptist church, we ask them, you know, we're all going to die. You know, are you 100% sure that your soul will be in heaven? And so what we're doing is we're bringing that savor of death, making them remember that they're just mortal men and that death could be right around the corner at any point in time. And that they need to think about what's going to happen after this life. You know, are they right before the Lord? Have they been forgiven for their sins or not? And so we bring the savor of death unto these people. Okay? We remind them that they're just mortal and there's judgment after this death. Even if they reject the gospel. But we bring that to their remembrance. And hopefully, hopefully we knock on their door again. Hopefully someone else in the church knocks on the door again. Hopefully another believer in another church knocks on the door again and gets a chance to talk to them once again. And that they can grow from that. They already had that savor of death. Hopefully the next person can give them the savor of life if they've rejected the first time. But even when we feel, hey, we weren't successful today. You know, this area is really difficult. They're not receiving the gospel. Hey, it's, it's worth it. To God, it's a sweet savor. Okay? It's worth it. Verse number 17. We're almost at the end here. Verse number 17. For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God. So what's this? There are many that corrupt the word of God. Do you get that? Paul says we are not as many which corrupt the word of God. Meaning there are are many preachers. There are many pastors. There are many evangelists. There are many ministers of God, so-called, that corrupt the word of God. And, and why, what does he mean? He's, he's not someone that corrupts the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as, sorry, but as of God, in the sight of God, speak we in Christ. So pay attention to those words. Just because someone says they're a Christian, just because they say, I love Jesus Christ, don't start listening to their preaching. Don't just accept any teaching of someone that says they love Jesus. Don't just start reading any book of any person that claims to be a Christian. Because they might be someone, there are many. There are many. That means there's few that don't corrupt the Word of God. There are many that corrupt the Word of God. And if you don't, if you're not careful, you know the first thing you should do before you listen to any preacher, before you read any book, is make sure, is this person even saved? Do they believe the gospel? Or are they corrupt in the gospel? And if they're corrupt in the gospel, you know the rest of the things that they're teaching are corrupt. But it says, as of sincerity. We saw the sincerity of Paul, that he would write to the Corinthian church, and yet in anguish of heart and in tears. Right? You know, this is, to me, this clear conscience before the Lord. You know, being sincere before the Lord. Because it says here, but as of God in the sight of God. So he recognizes that whatever I do, whatever I teach, it's in the sight of God. Um, In the sight of God, speak we in Christ. Which is why, you know, as a pastor, um, sometimes I'm very careful with what I preach and I make sure before I say anything stupid, you know, I've at least fact-checked it a number of times. Um, And I still say things that are wrong sometimes, okay? Because, you know, we're we're not infallible. But what's important to me is that I have a clear conscience before God. Whatever action I take, 
whatever I teach, whatever decision I make for the church, that I have a clear conscience. That's important to me. Okay? So there might be times you're like, well, you know, why aren't you preaching on this topic? Well, maybe my conscience isn't that clear on that just yet. You know, maybe there are little things that I need to refine first, okay? Why haven't you made that decision? Because I want a clear conscience before God. I want to make sure that I've, I've um, you know, um, I've, I haven't left any stone unturned before I deal with a situation or, or deal with things a certain way. Okay, it's important. Look, I would, rather, I would rather preach something incorrectly and wrong, but have a clear conscience before God. Just unknowingly preach something wrong, but just make sure that my conscience before God was, was, you know, was clear than to be forced to preach something that my conscience is not clear, but I think, well, maybe everyone wants to hear this. Maybe if I preach this, this will make me popular. Maybe this will make me friends with certain people out there. But I don't, if I don't have a clear conscience before God, I don't want to do it. Okay, I want to make sure at least the things that I teach are as right as I can be. And that's why when I preach, and, and, I, and I've picked this up when you guys preach, that you, we use a lot of Bible. Right? That's why I love going through a whole chapter. Because the more Bible we use the less wisdom you're going to get out of, out of Kevin's flesh. You know, the more doctrine that we base on the clear teachings of God, the more correct we know that the teaching is. And we know that it's out of sincerity because we're using God's word. But you know when you hear preaching and it's like that one little verse and then the next 20 minutes they're talking about whatever in their life, that's not sincerity. That's not a clear conscience. That's not, you know, speaking in Christ. That's just man's wisdom. That's just man trying to entertain you. And, and man lifting themselves up with pride and showing you how, how studious they are, how intelligent they are. You know, all the, the Bible college and, and, the, and the things that they learned, they're just putting that on show. They're going back to the Greek, going back to the Hebrew, just showing off, and they're not doing it out of sincerity. You know, when a man uses a lot of Bible verses, you know it's because they just want to have a clear conscience before God. The more Bible I use, the less I know I can mess it up. <laughs> you know? So we need to make sure that as preachers, we keep that in mind. Let's pray.